Okay, welcome to Whispers in the Wings with director, choreographer, performer, and writer Kathleen Ann Thompson, artistic director of Bellhurst Productions. Kathleen discusses on the program an approach to some of the most challenging and complex theatrical techniques which thespians are often known to whisper about in the wings of the stage. Kathleen's 25 years' experience with directing three schools for movement theatre and directing two theatre companies, as well as writing and performing award-winning productions for Bellhurst, has given her an infectious love of theatre. Her enthusiasm to elevate the craft of theatre for all types of performers and theatrical endeavours is uplifting. We hope you will be stimulated and inspired by these discussions. Today, Kathleen explores the pervasive significance which rhythm plays in developing a theatrical role. And now, Kathleen Ann Thompson and learning to sculpt memorable characterizations with rhythm. Welcome to Whispers in the Wings. This is our very first episode, and happy to have you listening in. I would like to address in these podcasts, in just a casual media setting like this, theater techniques which we thespians find essential to our craft, but often find them very difficult to grasp in a practical way. And we're also interested in hearing from you concerning subjects you'd like to hear about on future podcasts. So please keep in touch with us. Today we're going to explore role characterization and how rhythm is its essential catalyst. Characterization is a subject about which, of course, volumes of dramatic literature have been written. But in this short podcast today, I wanted to talk to you about what I think is the most pervasive influence in developing memorable characterizations, rhythm, and how actors can apply its elements to skillful role building. This is an element that is talked about a lot, but tremendously underused, actually, in practical application. The most essential quality of rhythm is its power to convey the presence of life. I didn't say that. Francois Delsart did, though. And I want to use it as a banner over our discussion here today because it sums up the fact that rhythm is the thumbprint of a character. It is identity, the DNA of an individual, forming and shaping the profile of its thinking its breathing, emotions, voice, and movement. Rhythm is also a master regulator of our bodily functions. has been ever since our conception. It supports breath, controls movement, creates thinking patterns, dictates our inner dialogues, creates a harmony or conflict in our relationships, and many, many, many more things. So let's get started with the process of characterization at its very conception, like you were, with rhythm. It's my experience in directing and working as a production doctor by assisting other productions which find themselves in the need of a professional troubleshooter in the middle of production, that most of the time there is a complete lack of understanding of rhythm and an ability to apply it in a systematic way to characterization as well as to scene and uh, act progression. But today I want to just emphasize its use in characterization. Therefore, I'd like to address two items in reference to rhythm and to characterization. Number one, what is rhythm really? And two, how can I actually practically apply this to developing a dramatic role? First, when I ask actors in my classrooms what is rhythm, actually they're quite ambiguous and vague. The definition is often limited to the parameters of time alone. But actually rhythm has several core elements which are very definable, each with a compendium of adjustment, an intensity adjustment, if you will. Now, the most prominent analysis of rhythm uh, and very exhaustive is found in the work of Rudolf Laban, a famed movement theorist and practitioner who analyzed rhythm in such a cohesive manner for movement artists that uh, nobody should uh, be 
without really a, the time to explore his writings. You'll find it very worthwhile, your study. Well, then let's look at Laban's analysis. Laban divides rhythm into four elements. Those are elements we can actually get our hands around when it comes to application. They are time, force, space, and flow. So let's look at each one individually for a moment. Time can be either action happening suddenly, like the popping of a balloon, or in a very sustained way, like the floating of a glider on a wind current. Force is applicable to the amount of energy it takes to move, so that can be a very light force, such as a silk scarf billowing softly down onto the floor, or like a heavy bowling ball dropping onto a floor. Space, the third element, refers to the manner of action, its behavior in a given space, which can be either flexible, uh, something like the tail of a snake if you're holding its head, or direct, like an arrow being shot directly into the bullseye of a target. Flow, the last element, is about the resistance to movement, being either free, like a paper airplane sailing across a, a classroom, or bound, like a prisoner struggling to free his shackled wrists from chains. So those four elements, time, force, space, and flow, those are our tools, and those are the elements of rhythm by which we can create a truly unique character. If we use a metaphor that probably most of us recognize, a soundboard, we know that there are all these sliders on the soundboard, and your sound technician sits behind and moves them up and down the increments of intensity for each uh, sound element that they represent. And as he does this, he mixes a kind of output that he wants with each single sound element being represented by a slider and that increase in intensity or decrease being controlled up and down a compendium. So if we use that as a kind of metaphor and we put our four rhythmic elements on sliders, one for time, one for force, one for space, and one for flow, then we can look at a couple of examples of movement, such as, let's say, a floating feather, and start to adjust those rhythmic elements. So on the time slider, we would slide it towards slow. On the force, we would bring it to light. On the space, we'd move it to flexible. And on the uh, flow, we would move it to free. So our floating feather would have a, a particular kind of rhythmic mix, uh, slow, light, flexible, and free. However, if we took another kind of action, very uh, contrasting action, like the stroke of an axe, then our time slider would come to sudden, and our force to heavy, our space to direct, and our flow to bound. So our axe stroke would have a mix of sudden, heavy, direct, and bound. So just like this soundboard, creating a mix of sound, we can do the same thing for our character. We can create a mix of rhythmic elements that are very identifying for a specific and individual character. Each of us has one of those <laughs> identities, those rhythmic mixes. All of us do. I remember my son when he was quite small, when he was about four, and my daughter, who was just a little bit younger, about 18 months younger, they both loved the telephone. And when the telephone would ring, my son would run down the hall, clomping his feet uh, as if he was in boot camp or something, and 
pushing something imaginary out of the way as if there were all kinds of foes trying to stop him from uh, uh, getting to the phone. And when he finally got to the phone, he, he'd reach for it like he was reaching for a grenade. And he'd pick up the receiver in, in a sudden, forceful way. His little little fists would be white at the knuckles. And then he'd shout some unintelligible monosymbol, uh, syllable into the, into the phone. Now, my daughter, on the other hand, when she would hear the phone ring, she would cock her head and she'd listen a couple of times as if she was listening to bells ringing, uh, uh, and she was very, very musical. And she would so lightly get up and tiptoe down the hall. And if there was nobody around, she would never fight her brother for it, but if nobody was around, then she would put two little fingers on the telephone and pick it up as if it were a, a, a moving um, worm under her two little fingers. And she'd hold it way above her head, she'd look into it, and then she would so sweetly just kind of coo something into the phone. So each of those children had such a strong rhythmic identity, and our rhythmic identity is always stronger and more observable when we are young than uh, when we get older. But now that my son is uh, an adult of many decades, he still has that rhythmic identity. It's still quite visible in him, in the way he cooks, the way he answers the phone, the way he drives his car, the way he does yard work. Even though society tends to uh, put uh, certain kinds of restrictions and refinements on our behavior, and there are certain mores and etiquette that we learn to abide by, nevertheless, the rhythmic identity stays with us. And this is so crucial for characterization. And without it, uh, our characters really don't have an, an orientation to movement, to thinking, to emotions uh, that is unified, that is a core, and that is actually unique. So the second issue we want to talk about is the application of that rhythm in character development. What do we have to do to uh, actually apply the knowledge of those four elements. I'm going to give you um, just four steps, they're very simple, that you can work for yourself in your own improvisational time or in a group with workshops and uh, begin to learn how to apply the rhythmic elements. The first step is what actually we've already done. We've already played around and made a rhythmic mix that we like. And you should write it down and be very specific about the elements. Uh, what kind of time factor is, is in that rhythm? And force and flow and space. Uh, think a lot about it and analyze your character. And once you decide on it, write it down just like you would write down a recipe to cook with so you can begin to work with it. Number two is to spend some time really workshopping your rhythm uh, so that you can gain an awareness. And this is really, really big. This is the most important thing. You must have a physical and emotional as well as mental awareness of what your rhythmic recipe is. What does it feel like to you, that rhythm moving you? What does that rhythm feel like as it motivates the pattern of your emotional uh, progress, your breathing and your, and your thinking. So we're going to start by doing some exercises in space. Now, I'm not talking about the rhythmic element of space, but environmental space where we can experience some awareness of rhythm. And I'll give you two exercises to, to do. So working with space, moving space, or being moved by space. So one is aggressive, one is passive. All movement is push or pull. So in space, think of space as something you can actually push around or that you can be moved by space or that you can pull space or be pulled by space. So play around with those ideas. And it, I think it's best to think of your environment, wherever you're working, as a kind of swimming pool and that it's filled not with water but with a substance of your choice, one that will facilitate you actually experiencing the rhythm in your body 
that you need. So if I was going to, for instance, work on my feather characterization, and I wanted to actually anthropomorphize a character uh, on stage that was a feather, all right, then I would take my rhythmic recipe, which was light and flexible and free and uh, sustained in its recipe, and I would create a substance and pretend that I was immersed in, let's say, egg whites, egg whites that are beat so they stand up stiff, like you would uh, use to put on lemon meringue pie. Now, as I move in space, I have to displace space, just like you do in water. So you can't just move into space without understanding that something else is displaced. In this case, it would be egg whites. So what kind of force, what kind of time, what kind of uh, space and uh, flow does my movement have as it moves through those egg whites? When you do this, be sure you get around to individual parts of your body so that you work as a three-dimensional uh, person and not two-dimensional. Try to get around to one joint at a time and uh, like move your left wrist through the egg whites. Then move your the back of your head backwards and your toe upward, your knee, your side of your hip, your belly forward, the back of your pelvis, the side of your rib cage, the shoulder, the chin, even the eyelids. Everything must displace space. So try to concentrate on one or two parts of your body at, the, uh, at a time and start to get a feel for how that rhythmic recipe causes you to move through this element or how the space moves you, how it presses upon you and moves in such a way as to influence you to be moved by it. So one perspective is uh, to penetrate through it, the other is to be passively moved by it. Now then, the second part of that exercise is a totally different perspective. And this has a lot more to do with your emotional, psychological awareness of your rhythmic recipe. And that is to create the inside of you as if it were hollow and a substance is inside of you. And that substance, again, like our substance outside, has a particular consistency. It's a particular quality of substance that causes a certain kind of rhythmic move against your body. So what if the inside of you, thinking of yourself as a a shaped kind of balloon, uh, was full of drying cement, cement that uh, was on its way to solidifying. Think of the kind of pressure that would be inside of you motivating movement. So in this case, you're not looking outside. You're not thinking of yourself immersed in a swimming pool of uh, a certain kind of substance, but instead are being moved and animated from a force inside of you that is doing the same thing. It's either pushing you or it's pulling you. But it is a particular quality of substance that carries with it uh, inherently a rhythm. And this will begin to give you physically, kinetically, a true awareness of how rhythm dominates our movement, how it begins to influence our thinking, and that's the third step, our breath and our emotions. So after you have explored this and have increased your awareness, then start to use the information you gain from that exercise to apply it to breathing, to thinking, your emotions. Uh, Starting with breath, uh, breath is a substance. Breath has weight. It has flow. It has direction. I can always remember visiting my mother in Arizona, uh, which I hated uh, to do, not because I didn't like my mother. I (laughs) wanted very much to visit her, but because the desert air for me, it appeared to be so heavy and oppressive and slow and 
it had a direct feel, as if it was just trying to press in me. It made me feel so... Uh, I wouldn't even say lazy. This would be too free. It made me feel oppressed. It made me feel like I didn't want to move, and I couldn't get my thinking up and alive and, and quick. Uh, I hated this hot desert air. I tried never to go there in the summertime. On the other hand, when I was a young uh, child, I rode horses all the time, and being on the plains of Colorado with my horse, uh, bareback, uh, at the time that a storm was starting to come down from the Rocky Mountains, this was an entirely different kind of air, and I loved it. There was something very, very, very electric in the air. The air seemed to have a rhythm of being absolutely like fire, uh, quick, sudden, very, very, very flexible, light, and free. And it was so exciting. And even the animals knew it. My horse knew it, and I knew it. And uh, we would, when we sensed that, the air had changed. We knew a storm was coming, and it was exciting to try to uh, ride quickly back to the stable and outride the storm. But it was a totally different kind of air. You breathe rhythmically, not just in a in a way of out and in and in a cycle, a three-phase cycle of breathing, but you also breathe with a certain rhythm. And your air has a kind of uh, rhythmic quality to it. I had an uncle who talked so slow and... Oh, my goodness, it was so difficult to listen to him. And it seemed as if the air coming out of his mouth was so slow, heavy. I mean, we, we as children, we used to just uh, snicker behind our hands. We thought he will never finish this sentence. So air is not just air. Air has a rhythm, and you breathe a certain rhythm. And because you breathe a certain rhythm, you think and speak with a certain rhythm. So your emotions are stimulated uh, by hormones, and but they are affected by the rhythmic quality of your body. And people have incredibly different rhythmic emotional profiles. Some people, you know, uh, just glide along on a on a very even keel of emotions. Every now and then they peak, uh, but then they come back to this sort of even keel. Other people are constantly like a rolling ocean in a in a thunderstorm. They are up and down and up and down and up and down and very fast. And others take a long, slow, slow, uh, forceful rise up to an emotional peak and then drop suddenly uh, at the end of it. And and return to start again. But emotions and emotional patterns within people, personalities, I call them, emotional personalities, they're very different. They're unique. And rhythm is the key to it. And the rhythm you discover that is your base, it is the orientation for how you're going to think, how the character is going to think, that will determine how they speak and how they breathe and how they move and how they feel. All of it is very concentric. It will be very unified. It will make your character so solid for you to find, for you to recreate if you are away from it for a couple of years and want to reconstitute a, a, a character. And most of all, it will make it memorable for the audience because the audience feels the rhythm it's nothing intellectually they think about. It's something they feel. Oh, they may forget uh, as soon as they're out of the theater any line that you said or what you even did. But they will never forget the feeling that your rhythmic character gave them and that they identified with and they will uh, f find it a unique thumbprint uh, that is attributed to your creation. So this is actually the process, annotating your your rhythmic recipe uh, and its effects on the functions of your character as you develop your role. That way you can consistently replicate it, keeping it uh, in a unified way and keeping it 
as something you can get your hands on and you can make malleable. So the character, as it moves through its emotional development, you can change those sliders a little bit. You can variable, make variables in that rhythmic mix and still keep within the central rhythmic recipe that you've established. And it's fun to do that. And you can now you have some tools to actually go in and and be as specific as a sound technician is to uh, modifying the sound slightly as the singer sings and as the instruments play and he makes his creation on that soundboard. Think of it in that same way. So actually, you know, summing up this short little uh, conversation about rhythm and characterization, I would just say analyze your character very carefully through the script, through the directorial perspectives you've been given, and begin to embody your character by creating a unique rhythmic recipe using those elements. Rhythm is something your audience will feel in their body. They won't easily forget it. After you've done that, you can gain a corporeal awareness of that recipe by working with rhythm in uh, the ways that I've said, using space inside your body, outside your body, pushing, pulling, changing your substances until you finally have a clear picture of how that body moves. From there, you will find the emotions will begin to sink in with that rhythm. The breath, the thinking, and the overall character will begin to be quite defined by that rhythm. You'll notice that your character begins to stimulate greater and greater detail and insight into its motives and its actions as the rhythm becomes more defined truly unforgettable roles are the result of a consistent and inspired rhythmic identity. Thanks for listening today. We'll talk again soon. My next episode will probably be discussing the important principle of fixed point on the stage. So I look forward to listening and to hearing from you and to talking with you again. Next time we meet on Whispers in the Wings. I'm Kathleen Ann Thompson. Artistic Director of Bellhurst Productions. You've been listening to Kathleen Ann Thompson, Director of Bellhurst Productions. Visit us at www.bellhurst.com.